everyone. Welcome back to another episode of this series that uh, we've been uh, tackling, uh, basically related to counter arguments against Islamic own arguments for Islam or for the Quran or for Muhammad. If you've been following this series, you've noticed that I have a great brother in the Lord and a great guest, Dr. David Wood, who has been doing a great job in basically uh, providing us with uh, some of the ways to respond to these arguments. And obviously, me being a former Muslim and an Arabic speaker as well, I am uh, doing the best we can also to show you that what Dr. Wood is sharing is actually coming truly from Islamic resources and even the Arabic resources support all of this information. So hopefully you'll find this series uh, to be a huge blessing to you and your ministry. And if you're a Muslim who is watching this particular episode or the episodes before or the ones that we'll be doing in the future, we pray that you will find it also encouraging to you. We challenge you to go and investigate the truth that is being shared with you so that you can make the decision to follow the only um, way, truth, and life, the only one that can lead you into heaven, our Lord Jesus Christ. Dr. David Wood, welcome again. Thank you. Well, uh, now we have another very popular argument. Um, I call this the, the argument from perfect preservation. And this argument actually makes me sad about how Muslims have been misled and deceived all their lives by their leaders. How so? And I say that because if you just read the Muslim sources, it's all over the Muslim sources about, I mean, in their main collections, I'm talking Sahih al-Bukhari, Sahih Muslim. If you're a Muslim scholar, if, you've, if, 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 you're, a, if you're a sheikh or something like that, you, you've read these sources. And so you know that these sources talk about all of the changes to the Quran. Right. And yet they keep telling the average Muslim on the street, the average Muslim in the mosque, that the Quran has been perfectly preserved right down to the letter from the time it was revealed to Muhammad. Right. And so that's what's sad. It's, it's that Muslims have this confidence in Islam based on these claims, that these things that they've been told. And what they've been told are completely false, even according to their own sources, and they don't know it. And they trust their leaders. They trust, they, they believe that their leaders have the evidence and the answers. And so their confidence right. isn't really in God, their confidence isn't really in uh, in Muhammad. Their confidence is in their leaders who are telling them all these false things. And so here, this is a perfect example of an area where Muslims are told something that is, if they just spent 10 minutes, if they just spent 10 minutes actually looking at what their sources say about this, they'd realize we've been we've been misled and why are we being misled they hope that's the question that they ask so let's look at an example we'll look at a, a verse from the quran which talks about uh, allah supposedly protecting the quran from corruption and we'll look at what muslim apologists say about the preservation of the quran and then we'll look at what their actual sources say so Wonderful. chapter 15 verse 9 of the quran Allah says, we have without doubt sent down the message and we will assuredly guard it. And then in parentheses, the translator adds from corruption. So Allah is guarding the message. No one's going to change the message because Allah is protecting it. And based on this promise, we have, for instance, uh, Mazar Kazi, and he's a, a Muslim apologist and, and watch what he tells his Muslim readers. He writes, Muslims and non-Muslims both agree that no change has ever occurred in the text of the Quran. It is a miracle of the Quran that no change has occurred in a single word, a single letter of the alphabet, a single punctuation mark, or a single diacritical mark in the text of the Quran during the last 14 centuries. Now, that is a very, very strong claim. Not a word, right. not a letter, not a punctuation mark. Nothing has changed in the text of the Quran for 14 centuries. And he says Muslims and non-Muslims agree. We're non-Muslims. Do we agree? Absolutely not. Based on the evidence available, we would never agree. And uh, I've actually uh, I've asked, uh, I, I know someone who actually goes to the scholarly conferences where, where they do have scholarly discussions of the text of the Quran. And I, I said, how many, how many of the scholars who go to these conferences believe that the Quran has been perfectly preserved right down to the letter? He says, none. 
And mm -hmm. why is that? Because they, they know the sources. They know the sources exactly. that we're about to talk about here. And by the way, uh, there are a couple of different de uh, directions you can go with this. You can actually um, set manuscripts side by side and examine the, the differences in the manuscripts and so on. Um, but uh, uh, we're going to look at a couple of uh, quotations from Muslim sources, Islam's most trusted sources on these issues about uh, the history of the Quran. And when you Okay. Yeah, I mean, David, I don't mean to cut you off. Uh, in, relation, in relationship to the manuscripts, I just want to mention to my audience, maybe they've heard about this, maybe they've never heard about it. Some Muslims are excited about the Sana'a manuscript, oh, yeah. 1972. They claim that this is the earliest to the time of the Prophet, but that alone has a boatload of problems. If this is the earliest you have, and it has all these kind of problems, you can only imagine what mm -hmm. happens to mm -hmm. the ones mm -hmm. that came after mm -hmm. it. Yeah. Um, and so there, there's... there's, uh, there's some very interesting work being done uh, in comparing the, the manuscripts. And by the way, if, if you think that the Quran has been perfectly preserved right down to the letter, you can look at the different manuscripts and you can circle the differences between uh, what was back then and the Quran that Muslims Absolutely. use today. Absolutely. Um, when you actually go to the Muslim sources, because Muslims, Muslims uh, passed on narrations and traditions about uh, how the Quran was compiled, uh, you get a story sort of like this. Um, Muhammad would receive a revelation. He would recite it to his followers. Some of his followers would write things down on a piece of bone or a leaf or something like that. Uh, that wasn't to put it into a book or anything. That was to as an aid to memory, right? You wrote it down on a leaf or something like that so you exactly. could take it back to your tent and that would help you memorize it. You could read it and recite it over and over again uh, until you had memorized it. So the Quran at this time wasn't meant to be a book in the sense that, that we think of a book, right? The Quran is, is to be memorized, to be written on, on your hearts, uh, and writing it down was just to help you memorize it later. So this is how the Quran is, is transmitted for years, but that eventually changed until it's put into a book. And it was, it, it, they started thinking of Quran in terms of a physical book, Right. During the reign of Abu Bakr, and why was it? Well, Abu Bakr came up with this brilliant military strategy, if Islam is true. In other words, if, if the Quran is the word of God, Abu Bakr had the most brilliant military strategy in, in history. <coughs> Abu Bakr uh, recognizes that the Quran, chapter 15, verse 9, promises that Allah is going to protect the Quran. So Abu Bakr takes all these people who had the Quran memorized, sends them into battle. Many of them are slaughtered. Muslims eventually win, uh, but tons of people, tons of Muslims who had parts of the Quran memorized were slaughtered. And parts of the Quran were lost forever. Parts of the Quran were lost forever. True. So let's go ahead and read it. This is from Ibn Abi Daud, who's the son of the, the great Hadith collector um, Abu Daud, uh, in his Kitab al-Masahif. He writes, many of the passages of the Quran that were sent down were known by those who died on the day of Yamama, that's the battle, but they were not known by those who survived them, nor were they written down, nor had Abu Bakr, Umar, or Uthman by that time collected the Quran, nor were they found with even one person after them. Notice what it says, many passages of the Quran that were sent down were known by people who died in battle, but were not found with even one person after them. Parts of the Quran were forever lost. And this is an Islamic source and very clear. Mm -hmm. And what, what the, the result of this is that Abu Bakr doesn't want any more of the Quran to be lost. Correct. So that's why he gathers people together. He gathers people together to have them write down what, what's left of the Quran so that if more people who have the Quran memorized die in battle, they won't lose any more of the Quran because they'll have it in a book form. Right. Even then, this isn't a book that's meant to be sent out. It's just we need a copy somewhere that has all of what we have left of the Quran. That way, we never lose any more of the Quran. So that's Abu Bakr's strategy. But uh, several Muslims had similar ideas in that they wanted to put their, their what they know of the Quran into book form. The problem was they had so many differences in their versions of the Quran that people started complaining to the Caliph Uthman. So this is after, after Abu Bakr dies, after Umar dies, and 
Uthman is the caliph, people start complaining to Uthman about all the differences that people are reciting the Quran, and they're worried that there's going to be division in the Muslim community over all of their differences. That's correct, after almost, almost 20 years after mm -hmm. Abu Bakr's collection. And so Uthman has everyone bring in, everyone bring their written versions of the Quran. And what does he do with them? Let's go ahead and read. And this is not in some obscure source. This is in Sahih al-Bukhari. What, what's more trusted in, <laughs> in well, Islam? Sahih al-Bukhari yeah. and Muslim, these yeah. are most trusted. So this is what happened, Sahih al-Bukhari, 4987. Uthman sent to every Muslim province one copy of what they had copied and ordered that all the other Quranic materials, whether written in fragmentary manuscripts or whole copies, be burnt. So this is Uthman. Uthman. He has all of the manuscripts of the Quran brought to him. He has Zayd ibn Thabit put together an official version of the Quran. He sends out copies of this new official Quran and he burns everything else. Now, if the Quran was perfectly preserved right down to the letter, wouldn't all of these Qurans match up perfectly? I mean, wouldn't... Absolutely. Absolutely. But they don't, so much so that he has to burn all of them. Now, now keep in mind, a lot of these Muslims had heard the Quran from Muhammad himself. They write down things based on how they had memorized it. Correct. And Uthman, at the end of the day, give me that, I'm burning it. Because it doesn't line up with this new official version of the Quran that I'm pointing out. And that's, um, this isn't quite what you have there, but it's ultimately descended from that. And w what's amazing is that um, Muhammad's top reciters of the Quran, he named four people who were his top reciters of the Quran, they didn't even agree with the, with the, the, the chapters that are in this Quran. This Quran. The That's first right. man on Muhammad's list of reciters, he said, if you want to learn the Quran from anyone, learn it from these four people. Right. And at the top of his list is Abdullah Ibn, Ibn Masood. Ibn Masood, exactly. Ibn Masood didn't believe that Surah 1, Surah 113, or Surah 114 are supposed to be in the Quran. These are prayers. These are Muslim prayers. He said, that's, that's not the Quran. Those are prayers that we, those are things we pray. And he's right about that because uh, Surah 1 has all kind of problems if you really insist that God had this Surah preserved in heaven for all of eternity because it speaks in a third person. That's Allah talking. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so Allah is talking about this, right? <clears throat> um, and so... That's, that's Ibn Masood's Quran. He didn't even agree with the chapters you have in the Quran. Now, now Muslims already have a problem, right? If, uh, if Muhammad knew what he's talking about, Correct. and Abdullah Ibn Masood is the guy you want to go to to learn the Quran. And he then, said, I don't agree with 114 chapters. Then, then, then this Quran is wrong. The alternative is, if this Quran is right, and Uthman knows better, and Zayd Ibn Thabit knows better, Right. Then Muhammad and Ibn Masood are wrong, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Then Muhammad, in particular, was wrong to even recommend Ibn Masood. So he didn't even know who to go with. But notice that already there are divisions in the Muslims don't even agree on what's supposed to be in the Quran. Correct. That's Ibn Masood. Another person on Muhammad's list of the top four was Ubay ibn Kab. Correct. And Ubay ibn Kab had two additional surahs that aren't in this Quran. So he had the 114 and two more. There were two additional Muslim That's right. prayers. And uh, just to give you a quotation, again, from Bukhari on uh, Ubay ibn Kab having more in his Quran, Sahih al-Bukhari, number 5005, Umar said, Ubay was the best of us in the recitation of the Quran, yet we leave some of what he recites. Ubay says, I have taken it from the mouth of Allah's messenger and will not leave it for anything whatever. Now think about that. This is Umar. Umar is acknowledging that Ubay ibn Kab is the best of the reciters among them. Right. And he says, but we have to leave off some of what he recites as the Quran. And Ubay says, I got it from Muhammad himself. I'm not giving this up from, for anything. This is Umar acknowledging that there are differences and disagreements in the Muslim community. And this is the caliph saying that what we recite, what your average Muslim recites as the Quran, we're leaving off some of what Ubay ibn Kaab recites, but he's the best reciter, and he's one of the guys on Muhammad's list of their top four reciters. It's, it's interesting because even Omar was responsible for revelation of multiple verses anyway himself, so I guess he knows best what belongs and what doesn't. No question, no question. And uh, so, I mean, but, but I mean, think about this already. Over and over, it, it, with the manuscripts and with the people dying in battle, it, these are not strange, weird sources were coming up here. This is what Islamic history shows. This is what you find if you go to actual Muslim sources and look up the history of the Quran. Correct. Your average Muslim is still told, perfect preservation, right down to the letter, 
not even a single difference in even a punctuation mark from the time of Muhammad. No disagreement among everyone, anyone. Muslims and non-Muslims agree on this. Yeah, Umar doesn't believe in this. Yep. Umar doesn't agree with this. Ubay doesn't agree with this. Ibn Masud doesn't agree with this. No one in the early Muslim community would have agreed with this. And that's really the sad reality here. Um, and I want to just mention, uh, you know, some facts about the manuscripts of the Quran. I'm, we're not going to get into that, but all I can say is some of the earliest manuscripts of the Quran, like Samarkand, for instance, has all kind of problems in it. It's incomplete. It has missing things. For instance, if you go, for instance, to chapter 3 verse 109 in today's Quran the one that David has in his hand this one in chapter 3 verse 109 you see the word Allah mentioned in there in Samarkand Allah is missing the word Allah is missing in chapter 5 for instance of the Quran verse 119 the word Allah is here the word Allah in Samarkand is missing what does that tell you that tells us tells the scholars who are studying the manuscript that there has been an evolution development in time where words were added. Now, whether the word Allah was there or not, all we know that somebody added the word Allah later, either because they felt the verse was incomplete or the pronoun that was there did not make it clear who the verse was talking about. Here's another thing uh, that I would like just to show, uh, basically, when we get to it, those uh, pictures mm -hmm. of manuscripts. Yep. Just once we get there, we'll talk about yep. more of that evidence. And uh, so now we want to look at some passages from Islamic sources. Uh, and there, there are more examples we can give, but I'm going to give an example of Muslim sources showing that entire chapters were lost, then right. that large passages were lost, Correct. then that verses were lost, and then even that phrases were lost. So this is just to show that there are various kinds of material coming up missing here. So uh, I'm going to read Sahih Muslim 2286. What's better than Sahih Muslim? Right? This is as good as it gets in Islam. Exactly. Right? Muslim and Bukhari. Yeah. So Sahih Muslim 2286. Abu Musa al-Ashari sent for the reciters of Basra. They came to him and they were 300 in number. So this is Abu Musa, companion of Muhammad, who later on is uh, asked for the reciters of Basra. They come to him. And so finally, these reciters get to hear from an actual companion of Muhammad. And they recited the Quran, and he said, notice, the, the, the reciters recite the Quran to a companion of Muhammad. And he said, you are the best among the inhabitants of Basra, for you are the reciters among them. So continue to recite it. But bear in mind that your reciting for a long time may not harden your hearts, as were hardened the hearts of those before you. He's talking about Muslims before them, hardening their hearts. He's warning the reciters not to harden their hearts. And what does he say? We used to recite a surah, which resembled in length and severity to Surah Barat. Chapter 9, basically. Yeah, that's 129 verses. Correct. So it's a 129 verse long chapter. I have, however, forgotten it, with the exception of this, which I remember out of it. So he's re he remembers a passage from this surah. He remembers this. If there were two valleys full of riches for the son of Adam, he would long for a third valley, and nothing would fill the stomach of the son of Adam but dust. Now, Al-Fadi, you know the Quran. Where is that in our Quran? It's no longer there. Uh, wait a minute. Abu Musa, <laughs> it's a companion of Muhammad. Yeah, he mentioned it. Yeah, that's he's right. talking to the reciters of Basra, and he says he remembers this being a surah, being a surah of the Quran, a surah that's as long as Surah 9, which mean at least 128 verses are missing. At least, right? So we have this verse, and then you got the 128 missing verses, right? So this is Abu Musa talking to reciters. Notice the reciters don't, don't uh, you don't know what you're talking about. The Quran's been perfectly preserved. Mm -hmm. They're being told by a companion of Muhammad about an entire missing chapter here. And it seemed like the companions of Muhammad did not really look at the preservation the way the Muslims look at it today. Yeah. It seemed like they were no casual question. about yeah. it. They mm -hmm. were just mentioning about it. Otherwise, why would they reveal something like mm -hmm. this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and yeah, I mean, why, why aren't they trying to conceal it? I mean, Uthman is trying to cover up differences, but he's trying to prevent division in the Muslim community, That's right. right? Like, That's right. Uh, it's not, hey, this is our, our main argument for the authority of Islam. It's, hey, we need unity and no disagreement. Therefore, I'm burning all the differences and so on. But in terms of perfect preservation right down to the letter, it, it doesn't seem to enter their mind. Um, it, Abu Musa goes on. So after he quotes the verse that he remembers from this lost chapter that is no longer in the Quran, 
And we used to recite a surah which resembled one of the surahs of Musabahat, and I have forgotten it. So he, this is Abu Musa in Sahih Muslim, talking about two missing chapters of the Quran. He even quotes a verse from it. So this isn't just him saying, hey, I personally forgot a chapter of the Quran. It's chapter eight. Everyone else remembers it except me. He's, it's not in the Quran. We know because he gives an example of a verse from it. It's not in the Quran. So that's an example of entire chapters of the Quran coming up missing. Um, next, this is from Abu Ubaid's Kitab Fada'al al-Quran. Aisha said, Surat al-Azab, that's chapter 33 of the Quran, Surah 33, used to be recited in the time of the Prophet. So this is, this is Aisha talking. She knows how this surah was recited during the time of Muhammad. Used to be recited in the time of the Prophet with 200 verses. But when Uthman wrote out the codices, he was unable to procure more of it than there is in it today, i.e. 73 verses. So think about this. This is, once again, this is Aisha. That's right. Saying, I remember, I remember Muslims reciting Surah 33 during the time of Muhammad. And it had about 200 verses in it. And now, but all Uthman could come up with when he has Zayd ibn Thabit compile the Quran, all he could come up with was, was 73. Why? Yeah. Well, lo lots of passages came up missing. People forgot to recite them. Uh, That's right. Uh, uh, Either died or forgot to recite them. Abu, Abu Musa already said they were hardening their hearts. They're forgetting stuff. He gives examples of chapters, but guess what? Other things came up missing too. Muslims just didn't recite them. And by the time you get to Uthman, lots of it had been lost by, by dying in battle or, or Muslims just hardening their hearts and not reciting things enough. But you're talking about two thirds, two thirds of Surah 33 coming up missing. So more than another hundred verses. Correct. More than another hundred verses. Of the, so we're already in the hundreds, hundreds, plural, of verses that it's, it, they're not saying, hey, these were abrogated or something like that. These were lost. Muslims hardened their hearts. People died in battle. These verses are gone now. Absolutely. Absolutely. Sunan Ibn Majah, 1944. So we looked at missing, uh, missing chapters. Uh, large passage came up missing. And now we'll look at some individual verses coming up missing. This is Sunan Ibn Majah, number 1944. It was narrated that Aisha said, the verse of stoning and of breastfeeding an adult 10 times was revealed, and the paper was with me under my pillow. When the messenger of Allah died, we were preoccupied with his death, and a tame sheep came in and ate it. Literally, the sheep ate it. The sheep ate the paper that she had That's these right. verses on. That's when and, you say holy sheep. Yeah. Now, in, in, in the Muslim sources, right, you, you go to the Hadith, you find all over the place where they're talking about the verse of stoning. This is, they knew That's this. Right. They knew That's that there's right. a verse of stoning in the Quran. Omar is the one who insisted it was there. Yeah. And uh, he, he said, he said, after it came up missing and was no longer in there, he, he's the one who said, I would write it in the Quran, but I'm worried about someone seeing me write something in the Quran and saying Umar's adding to the Quran. That's right. And the verse of breastfeeding an adult, you read, there's an entire section in Sahih Muslim about this verse of breastfeeding an adult uh, 10 times. And just to give you guys a quick idea of what this is about, there was a problem in the early Muslim community where uh, a, a woman who's married might have to work around a man. Maybe she has a male slave or uh, she has to, there, there's a male who works around her or something like this. And they're worried about committing adultery or something like this while the husband's gone. And so this problem is brought to Muhammad. Hey, Muhammad, what happens when a woman's got to be around a man? How are we going to avoid uh, them having an adulterous affair or something like this? Muhammad gets the revelation from Allah and the revelation of Allah is no problem. Just have the woman breastfeed the man 10 times. And after she breastfeeds him 10 times, he'll be considered her son. And so they won't be tempted to have sex and anymore. problem solved. Yeah, problem solved, right? That, that eventually got abrogated to five times. That's it. That's in the Muslim source. That's in Sahih Muslim, right? It got abrogated to five times. Oh, you only need women. You only, ladies, you only need to stick your breasts in this guy's mouth five times now in order to prevent any sort of sexual attraction from, from developing. And so it was, it was, it was revealed as 10, then revealed as five. Neither one of those verses are in the Quran today. What happened? Aisha's sheep ate them, right? That's a good excuse, by the way. And notice what she says. She had this, she had this when Muhammad died. So it's still the Quran. They still have a physical copy of the Quran when Muhammad dies and her sheep ate right. this. Now, by the way, Muhammad's wives were horrified. Uh, one, Aisha had been accused of adultery, right? Correct. And, 
And Muhammad's wives were horrified at the idea of having to breastfeed a guy whenever you're, you're around him and stuff. And we, we, then we, don't, we don't want to put it's, our breasts in this guy's mouth. It's a weird way to overcome <clears throat> sinful desires. And it's ridiculous to anyone with a brain, right? I mean, you have to have some really strange ideas to think that this is actually a way to avoid yeah. sexual tension. Um, but think about this. Muhammad's wives are horrified by this verse being in the Quran. And Aisha was accused of adultery. Yeah. So the verse of stoning would apply to her if it would, that That's penalty right. had ever. She was at one time terrified of being stoned. And these verses, she has the copy, and her sheep comes in and ate it, uh, ate them. Is that a coincidence? I mean, is that, are you it's, serious? Are, are you, it's unbelievable, yeah. definitely. And, and like you mentioned, uh, Dr. Wood, that these things are there in the Islamic resources. Mm -hmm. These are written there. Anyone can go to them. Yep. It's not like it's hidden from them. And yet, our Muslim friends insist on trying to defend even the very resources that we've just shared with them. Yep, and, and right out of their sources. Matter of fact, I'll make it even easier with this next example because I'm going to give an example straight from the most popular Quran available in English. You can get, you can walk into any bookstore that has copies of the Quran, and you'll find the Yusuf Ali edition of the Quran with his commentary. And if you go and you look up. You look up Surah 33, watch what you find. Now, this is his footnote. <clears throat> hmm? Yeah, so we'll read the verse, and then he includes in his footnote, remember, Umar said, we leave off some of what Ubay ibn Kaab recites. That's right. That doesn't just refer to entire chapters, that's also to uh, some other things. So, chapter 33, verse 6 of the Quran, the prophet is closer to the believers than their own selves, and his wives are their mothers. Now, here we might wonder, why, why are Muhammad's wives called the mothers? Wouldn't that make him like the father, like the That's spiritual correct. father of That's the Muslim correct. community? Well, uh, Yusuf Ali apparently likes that idea as well, which is why he includes in his footnote, which you can, you can get his Quran and look at the footnote, he adds, in some kiras, like, now what's a kira? Uh, meaning in some readings, basically. Yeah. In some kiras, like that of Ubay ibn Kaab, occur also the words, and he is a father of them, referring to Muhammad which imply his spiritual relationship and connection with the words, and his wives are their mothers. So this is a Quran available in English. Now, uh, he could have added all kinds of notes on differences in the Quran. Right. Muslims usually avoid them. He apparently added this because he liked it, right? He liked Ubay ibn Kaab's version of the Quran better, thinking, oh, Muhammad is our sort of spiritual father, which would make sense if his wives are, are their mothers, right? That's correct. And so here you have it in, in the Quran that Muslims pass around, and Muslims will have this Quran with them, they have it on their bookshelves, and they still maintain perfect preservation right down to the letter from the time it was revealed to Muhammad, even when the Qurans they have available to them show them that this is false and that, that Muhammad's own scholars and own reciters had differences in their versions of the Quran. Now, um, one last sort of to sum up, and then if you wanted to comment on, uh, yes, on, on the manuscripts. Um, this is from Ibn Umar. So Ibn Umar, that's the son of Muhammad's companion, Umar, and he was a companion of Muhammad as well. Um, Ibn Umar says, in response to people who are saying that they have the entire Quran memorized, right? So there are Muslims right. who are bragging that they had the entire Quran memorized. So later Muslims, like these reciters of Basra and so on, they're bragging, I've memorized the entire Quran. Ibn Umar rebukes them. Watch what he says. Let none of you say, I have learned the whole of the Quran. For how does he know what the whole of it is when much of it has disappeared? Let him rather say, I have learned what remains thereof. So even if you memorize the entire Quran today, Ibn Umar says you don't have the entire Quran. Why? Entire chapters came up missing. Large passages came up missing. Verses came up missing. Correct. Phrases came up missing. The early Muslim community understood that the Quran had gone through changes over and over and over and over again. And think about this, You're, the Muslim scholars who know these sources, they know these sources, they still go and tell you Muslims out there, the Quran has been perfectly preserved right down to the letter. Not a single letter, not a single punctuation mark has ever been changed from the Quran. Certainly not the picture we get when we look at the, the Muslim sources. That's correct, and uh, thank you uh, for all of the information. Hopefully, uh, those who are watching this episode will uh, benefit from these references. And once again, we 
really uh, encourage you to go and inspect the sources that we've quoted for you. I want to just close by showing you this image that you're looking at right now. Um, this is one of the main manuscripts, the early manuscripts of the Quran. There's about six of them. One of them is called Samarkand, basically. And supposedly, these two images that you're looking at come from the exact same manuscript. But you don't have to be a Quranic scholar or calligrapher, which is the science, uh, science of writing the, the letters of the Quran. Just look at the top picture and the bottom picture. Does the handwriting style look the same to you? Of course not. Not at all. In fact, the top one is probably was earlier writing and the bottom one is a little bit later. What does that tell us? If it is in the same manuscript, you have differences in not only uh, different scribes writing it, but even the style of writing have changed. And not to mention, of course, I want to point out that you can see that there are no dottings or diacritical markings, which makes it even more difficult to try to pronounce it correctly. That was one of the chief problems that Uthman faced, that people will read it according to their own dialect, because there are no guidance here in terms of diacritical markings and pointings and other things like that. So, um, Dr. Wood, uh, what can we tell our Muslim uh, friends about issues like this? What is it that they need to do? <clears throat> well, I'm, I'm hoping, once again, that, that a light bulb turns on, right? Um, if, if you put your trust in someone, right? And, and that's natural to do, right? I, 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 I'm, not, I'm not criticizing Muslims for, for growing up and, and trusting their religious leaders. That's very natural for a person who grows up in a, in a, um, a religious community to trust what his leaders and scholars are telling him. That's what he's been told all his life. When you realize, when it is put right in front of your face, when the facts are put right in front of you that show you that these people are not telling you the truth, that right. what they're saying to you in the mosque, what they're saying to you in their books, what they're saying to you in their lectures is completely different from what your own sources say, from what Muhammad's companions said, from what your greatest Hadith collectors said about the preservation of the Quran. When that happens, then that's when it's no longer reasonable to trust your religious leader. So we, we just, by nature, we trust our parents, we trust the communities we, we, grow in, we grow up in and so on. When you realize the evidence is put right in front of your face, that what they are telling me does not line up with reality, that's when, in order to be reasonable, you have to say, I can no longer trust these people, these scholars, the way I used to trust them. Now I have to, I have to doubt what they're saying, and I have to look into it for myself. And so if you believe that the Quran has been perfectly preserved, and it hasn't been, that's a time to reformulate your view. Now, just to be clear, if Muslims didn't, didn't believe that the Quran has been perfectly preserved and used this as evidence, I wouldn't really consider it a problem, right? Even if God reveals something and, you know, and he puts it in the hands of Muslims and uh, then they forget some of it or something like that, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't care much, right? Uh, right? But Muslims are making this uh, the standard, right? That we know it's the word of God because perfect preservation right down to the letter. That's a weird argument because there are books that have been have been around longer than the Quran, right? If you right. dig up a, a book from ancient Greece or something like that, well, guess what? That's been around longer than the Quran. It has nothing to do with whether it's the Word of God. But if you're making that the standard, and we look and we see that the Quran has not been perfectly preserved, then you've got a problem. You've got a problem because you fail your own test of authenticity, and your leaders are deceiving you. And those are huge problems. And those are the sorts of things that should make Muslims stop and say, I need to start studying this for myself instead of basing my confidence in my religion on what people have told me. Amen. Uh, what about uh, next time? Which argument do you think uh, we should tackle? Well, next time we'll be looking at an argument which comes from the Quran, but sort of in a reverse direction. There are Muslims who argue that we can know that Muhammad is a prophet because of his miracles, when the Quran says something very different about Muhammad's miracles. So we'll be looking at the argument from miracles. Muhammad is a prophet because of his miracles. Well, we are uh, definitely look forward to that. Um, thank you again uh, to you for watching uh, our episode on the uh, argument related to the preservation or the perfect preservation of the Quran. Hopefully, you'll find this show uh, to be uh, useful to you in your own ministry or in your own search for the truth. Until we meet again, have a blessed day. Mm -hmm.